trust and respect that uh, skepticism because historically, if you look at how the federal government in medical, medical matters has over decades treated African-Americans, the history is not a good history. It took place before many of you were born. It was decades and decades ago. But the memory of that history is still there. And it goes back to the terrible situation uh, with Tuskegee and the experiments that were done. What you can assure African-Americans is that since that time, there have been ethical safeguards put in place that it would make it totally impossible for that ever to happen again. Because before any experiment, any clinical trial, such as the clinical trial that led to the safety and the efficacy proving of this vaccine or this group of vaccines, it has to go through an institutional review board and has to get ethical approval before it can be done. So having said that, you ask, well, how do we know this is safe and effective? The reason is that the trials were done with 30,000 people with Moderna and 44,000 people with Pfizer. And the determination of whether the, the, the vaccine is safe and effective is not made by the federal government. It's not made by the company. It's made by an independent data and safety monitoring board who is beholden to no one, not to the government, not to the, to the company, but to the American public. And for both of those vaccines, they determined that based on the very striking data that the vaccines were safe and effective. Then you say, well, what about the approval of the vaccine? It ultimately gets approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. However, the ones who determine whether it's okay to distribute it to the American public are the career scientists, not politicians, not people who you feel might have a vested interest. And they do that in association with an independent advisory committee. So when people ask, how do you know it's safe and effective? The answer is we know because that determination was made independently and transparently. So we feel very confident that the things that we did to safeguard the safety and to prove the efficacy are really foolproof. And that's the reason why we're very confident about it. The reason why I got vaccinated, the reason why President Biden and Vice President Harris got vaccinated because of the confidence in the safety and the efficacy. Right. Well, Dr. Fauci, we know that you have to get to another meeting right now. Dr. Walter. Mm -hmm. So good morning, everyone. I am Carmen Walters, the 14th president of Tougaloo College, and I'm excited to have all of you here sharing on the, at this virtual, in this virtual webinar with us, the impact of COVID-19 on minorities in Mississippi vaccinations implications. We are all aware of the challenges we are facing due to COVID-19. Therefore, we wanted to offer this webinar today simply because of those challenges. Tougaloo College has a longstanding history of social justice and leadership, and we are poised to support the solutions of the issues of health disparities and health injustice in our state, our region, and in our country. We pledge to work with leaders like our panelists, especially you, Dr. Fauci, by acknowledging and supporting the research and the science uh, to end the, the pandemic. It is a profound honor to have local, state, and national public health experts leading today's webinar. Dr. Fauci, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your time. Thank you for your work and all that you are doing to protect the nation's health. You are a role model for our students and you have been a role model for me personally since the years of the AIDS epidemic. Dr. Thomas E. Dobbs, our state health officer, thank you for the work you are doing to keep Mississippians informed about the devastating effects of COVID-19 and the importance of vaccination. Thank you for being a partner to Tougaloo College and for advising us and me personally on how to keep our students 
faculty and staff safe. Thank you for joining us today. And to our Tougaloo alumni, Dr. Myrna Alexander Nickens, University of Mississippi Medical Center cardiologist, and Dr. Obi McNair, Central Mississippi Health Services Physician and Chief Operating Officer. Both of you have been advisors to me through this trying time. So we wanna thank you for being public experts who are sensitive to the worries and fears of the community and for your willingness to increase awareness and interact uh, with our webinar today around the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Shari Walker, Chair and Associate Professor, Biology and Faculty Senate Chair for moderating today's important webinar designed to erase the misconceptions about the COVID-19 vaccine. And finally, a special thank you to Dr. Wendy White, Principal Investigator, Undergraduate Training and Education Center, Jackson Heart Study for your role in facilitating the webinar, keeping us connected and engaged in preparation for today's event. We would not be here today if it weren't for you, Dr. White. On behalf of Tougaloo College Board of Trustees, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, we wanna thank all of you and Dr. Fauci, please remain encouraged. Know that there are millions of people supporting you every day and believing in what you are doing. We support you 100%. Tougaloo is your partner in solving the pandemic. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Dr. Waltz. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Take care. Back to you, Dr. Walker. Thank you so much, Dr. Walters. So now in this next half of our webinar today, we're going to move to what are we looking like at the state level? What is it like here in Mississippi? And we know based on the recent data that many of you all may have seen on yesterday's news that we had a total of almost a thousand new cases just yesterday and 40 new deaths, bringing our death total to 6,429 individuals. So we want to talk to those who are leading the field locally on the work and the vaccination. We'll speak with Dr. Thomas Dobb, who is the state health officer here in Mississippi. He previously served at the Mississippi State Department of Health for a number of years in the roles of district health officer and state epidemiologist. He is a board certified in internal medicine and infectious diseases. And he's a member of the Mississippi State Medical Association and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. He's an associate professor at UMMC School of Population Health, and he became the state health officer in 2018. Welcome, Dr. Dobbs. Good morning, and, and thank you all for having me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to go over some new information that no one's ever seen before. So we'll have some breaking data that has never been presented. So I'll go ahead and bring that up. And, and I think we'll focus mostly on the, the vaccine effort, if, if that's agreeable to everybody. I know that's where a lot of interest is. And, and speaking a little Absolutely. bit to, to the um, point you made before, we are still seeing quite a number of cases in Mississippi. We're still looking at around 1,000 cases a day which is not acceptable. Um, even though it's better, it's not okay. We still are having people who are dying unnecessarily. We still have many ICU units that are full of people who are dying from COVID. So just because it's better doesn't mean it's okay. We have a long way to go. And we'll talk about the vaccination a little bit, but we still need to do those very simple things that we know prevent transmission, wearing a mask in public and limiting social gatherings. Um, we don't wanna share other people's air and that's how we spread COVID. Um, almost entirely. If we look at where the state is within the immunization effort, you can see um, as we speak, um, at, because we're always giving more and more immunizations, more than 300,000 Mississippians or over 10% of the population has received at least one dose. And we're closing in on 400,000 total doses have been distributed in Mississippi, which is fantastic. You can see that there's significant geographic variability, but it does mostly correlate with population. So um, per capita, there's relatively relative stability within um, you know, uh, one or two percentage points uh, margin of, of, of difference. But, but there is some difference out there without a doubt. And one of the most important differences that we see 
is going to be with uh, pop subsets of the population, especially when we consider uh, African American populations and when we consider um, Hispanics, but also uh, Native American populations, where we need to do a lot better job making sure folks are protected with the vaccine. If we look temporally, um, you can see that we've made uh, steady progress in our vaccination efforts. Um, this little dip here was mostly before we jumped into the second doses and a little bit of us processing previous uh, vaccine. But you can see that when we look at our older populations, we've done reasonably well. Over 40% of everyone over 75 has received at least one dose of vaccine and um, more than a third of everybody 65 and older has received at least one dose of vaccine. And this is going to be extremely important as we go into the spring months in, in protecting folks and preventing unnecessary, unnecessary hospitalizations and deaths. But let's dig in a little bit and look at um, some subset, subsets of the population. And as we mentioned, we haven't really proportionally been able to get vaccines to uh, certain parts of our state, especially black communities. But we have seen some improvement in this. And this is something we've been paying attention to from the very beginning. We learned very early in the pandemic last spring when we were a week or two behind realizing how bad it was in the black community. And we said, we're not going to forget that ever again. When we start, we're going to start every component of this with a health equity lens. And you can see that although we're kind of off to a sluggish start, we are starting to tick up in the percentage of folks who are um, African-American getting the vaccine has increased from about the, a low of 13% of the vaccine that's been distributed now around 21%. Now that's not okay, but it's progress. And we do have strategies going forward and we have fantastic partners. Um, Dr. McNair and I were just chatting a little bit earlier and uh, they're doing a great job getting out to their communities. And that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these strategies that we're gonna continue to use going forward. Um, if we look at COVID vaccine in Mississippi, who is eligible? It's people who are 65 and older people with chronic medical conditions who are over 16 and healthcare workers. There are a limited number of ways of getting the vaccine, but that is growing. You can go through a county drive through clinic and schedule here at covidvaccine.umc.edu or through the phone line. Um, we have local clinic partners who have been playing an increasingly important role. We have community-based events, which I'll talk about very briefly. Uh, Walmart has started offering at some of their locations, which were selected based on areas of, of um, uh, of lagging vaccination rates and also additional pharmacy locations will be coming soon in addition to additional local clinic partners. Let's talk a little bit about intent to take the vaccine and this is all new data um, also that has not been seen. This is a trust survey that we've been doing through our Office of Health Equity and this is the percentage of people in Mississippi who are planning to take the vaccine. 72% of Mississippians are planning to take the vaccine, which I think overall is really good news. And still we have about 12% that are unsure. So, you know, if we can get all this, all of the planning and then all the unsures, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be pretty much close to that sort of theoretical um, herd immunity value, right? So we, I think we're looking pretty good, but we need to break it down. Let's look at about who is willing and who is not willing. We see a significant difference in those that definitely will take it between um, white Mississippians and black Mississippians. Although we think we've made some headway in the trust gap, it is still there. And although 50% of Mississippians who are black is a large percentage and accounts for the significant demand we see in black Mississippians, it's not gonna stay that way. We need to get, not only um, we need to get the, the, um, the interest within black folks up, but um, um, black folks up from 39.9%, um, we need to get everybody up um, a little bit lower within the uh, 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 Latinx community. And then you can see um, a little bit more sort of uh, less enthusiastic, but okay responses within the probably will. When we get to the not sure and the probably not, and then the will not, you can see that black Mississippians um, really, there's a lot of black folks who don't trust. And I don't think it's a surprise. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we really do everything we can to provide that reassurance, answer those questions, and understand what are those foundational issues that lead to the lack of trust and address them in every way possible. Um, we need your help. Um, this survey is not entirely complete. This is preliminary data. So we would like everyone to please go on and consider completing the um, trust survey that we have through the Department of Health. We have it English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Um, and I did put this information at my, my Twitter site. It's also on our website. It should be 
uh, back up there very, very soon. We want to get as many people, especially people in disparity communities, to give us information about what do they think about getting the COVID vaccine. Trust. From our survey thus far, Mississippians in general are most likely to be influenced to take the COVID vaccine by their primary physician, uh, the State Department of Health, or CDC, or a family member. Um, if we look at other parts of the population um, in our Hispanic community, uh, I hate Dr. Fauci's not here, but he would have liked to see that he and the NIH are the most influential. So um, they've certainly been a fantastic voice. But within the black community, without a doubt, church leaders are the most influential. And we've been working closely with church leaders, as you're, as you're aware, and we will continue to do that and try to have ongoing dialogue um, to answer those questions, because that oftentimes is a mechanism through which um, black communities can have access to information and then disseminated uh, within, within their populations. If we look at access, we know we also have to address the access issue. It's not just trust, but it's also access. And we've been working on this aggressively. Um, we've been increasing call line capacity. We have a devoted line for people 75 and older. We're expanding locations. Um, we're working aggressively on outreach and education. One of the things that's really and really been very interesting, I think we've made good progress over the past couple of weeks, is helping people understand how to get an appointment, overcoming those gaps of, uh, of understanding. Um, and then part of that is partner assistance. We've actually had um, several uh, black churches have done really innovative work as far as getting people who don't have internet access, getting their information and signing up for them by getting volunteers within their congregations. It's really been a beautiful thing to watch. Um, we also are gonna continue to work with partnerships um, with uh, clinics and locations that have proven success records. Community health centers have been a remarkable mechanism for us to reach underserved communities. If we look at the percentage of vaccine within the state that goes to, to, to black folks, you know, it's about 20%, but within the community health center world and some other clinics, it's over 70%, right? So that's an easy place to invest our resources. Um, so that's something we'll continue to, to, to augment. And then also we want to do targeted outreach with local communities, churches, municipalities, at-risk at -risk populations. Um, we, we've had really remarkable work with um, some of our local folks. Uh, St. Dominic's has done a great job bringing vaccines to, to black churches and to the homeless. Um, uh, Hattiesburg Clinic in the city of Jackson is, is um, going to start vaccinating in the community where people where people live. Um, this is just an example of some of the ones that are going forward. And we've got a, a big partnership with the city of Jackson. Um, I won't give away their uh, their information, but uh, be expecting to see something exciting out of the city of Jackson very soon. So still lots to do, um, but we're making progress and we think we're on the right track. Uh, thank you very much for this time and I look forward to any questions. Great, thank you so much for that data. Hot off the press, we appreciate that. Um, we're going to ask um, now that Dr. Myrna Alexander Nickens and Dr. Obi McNair now join the conversation. Dr. Alexander Nickens is a proud graduate of the Tougaloo College, 1978. And just like Tougaloo does it, she is the first female interventional cardiologist in Mississippi. Wow, what an accomplishment. She currently serves as a professor of medicine at UMMC and has also served as the Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion at UMMC. She is a member of the American College of Cardiology, the American Medical Association, and the Association of Black Cardiology. Her research interests include heart disease in women, valvular heart disease, and preventive cardiology for individuals 15 years of age and older. Welcome, Dr. Alexander Nickens. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Walker. Thank you You're so more much, than Dr. Welcome. Walker. Can you hear me? Absolutely, we can hear okay. you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Dr. Dobbs, I would like to uh, ask a few questions of you. When we uh, discovered that we were on this panel, uh, all of my friends were quite excited. They uh, shot me a lot of uh, questions. You've answered a lot of them already. Um, but I did, I want to uh, give a shout out to another group that really picked up, and that's the Jackson Hines Comprehensive Health Center. Uh, in our community, they really picked up 
and um, got the doses and they were able to get doses in arms. Uh, and so they have been in our community for uh, several decades and I wanna thank them for doing that. Uh, when I initially, uh, uh, when we initially started vaccinating people, um, my husband was just hysterical about why we did not have a place in Hines County. And so we've talked about that because of pl the place we didn't have a place. And I, you know, I think uh, we are doing better about getting those vaccinations um, uh, in, in the arms. But, uh, you know, I don't wanna continue. I, I do have uh, several questions that these guys have sent me. Uh, it, one of the questions that was sent was, is there a task force um, that you are a part of um, with other people, other community people, uh, with some African-American representatives on that task force to lay out where things should go as far as vaccinations, how they should be administered and how we can help people help administer those, those vaccinations. It, um, I don't know that we have one specific task force, but we have multiple partnerships that are sort of operating con continuously. We do have um, a phenomenal, phenomenally strong health equity division within the Department of Health. And they are leading that effort. Um, we have several working groups with um, uh, black ministers. Um, we have a project we're working now with the city of Jackson. We have um, ongoing partnerships with um, the Community Health Center Association and all those members. Um, so there's not just one, uh, but just know that there are a lot of uh, voices, um, brown and black voices that are making it to us through multiple mechanisms. Uh, there's not a singular one, but there are multiple. Right. I think one of the problems that we had uh, initially was not that African Americans didn't want it. Of course, there are some that do not do, uh, choose not to take it or um, not sure of it right now. But um, for the most part, it was accessibility. And I think uh, we are doing a better job with that. Uh, even at my church, I've talked to those guys about having a call center helping those people that can't go online. Um, to sign people up, but having a sort of a vaccine call center for my for our church people. And I think if we took that in the smaller communities, we could get uh, shots in arms, <laughs> so to speak. But uh, I, um, I'm, I'm not going to take up all the time, uh, Dr. Walker, but I just want to put that in and any other questions I am here to answer. Thank you, Dr. Alexander Nickens. We appreciate you. We also have here Dr. Obi McNair Sr., who is a physician and chief operating officer at Central Mississippi Health Services. Once again, another proud Tougaloo alum, class of 1977, and the former medical director of Central Mississippi Health Services. He is a board certified physician who specializes in internal medicine and pulmonary disease. Dr. McNair has over 40 years of experience in the medical field, which makes him a perfect fit for today's panel. Welcome, Dr. McNair. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's such, such a pleasure to be on this uh, call today with uh, this august body that you've assembled, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. Uh, I did wanna make a few comments. I do, I do think I submitted a question in the chat for Dr. Dobbs, but uh, one of the things I feel compelled to talk about is that one of the reasons why you have uh, increased morbidity and mortality in the African American community is a lack of uh, access to uh, quality health. And one of the things I'm concerned about is that uh, Mississippi has uh, a lot of people that would qualify for Medicaid and we really need to consider the Medicaid expansion. Um, our new administration has said that uh, they are interested in uh, 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 pumping up and, and uh, revitalizing the Affordable Care Act. And one of the basic tenets of that is the Medicare ex expansion to the state. So I would encourage our leaders uh, in, uh, in politics, the governor, Mississippi State Medical Association, Mississippi Medical and Surgical Association to really push this. Now, I know there are positives and, and negatives of that, but if you weigh them on the balance uh, scale, I do believe that the positives for expanding do outweigh the negatives. 
The, less, the next thing I want to say is that one of the reasons why I think you see such reticence in the African-American community to take the, vi uh, the vaccine is that a lot of dif disinformation is out there, particularly on the internet. And, uh, you know, these things are, are, are passed along and it's just before you know it, thousands of people have passed along information that's not correct. So I would encourage people to get their information from more reliable sources, such as Dr. Dobbs, uh, such as Dr. Fauci, their primary care physicians. And, and let's not uh, let the internet uh, practice medicine for us. Uh, the other thing I think that makes, uh, uh, I think, a problem for people is that the, the, the rapid development of this vaccine. Uh, it was called Operation Warp Speed. And a lot of people say, oh, it's, it came out too fast. And, you know, it must be a problem. But if you delve down into that study, it was amazing how they did that. And basically, just to say this, uh, the government gambled. They, they produced the vaccine while they were doing the clinical trials. And at the end of those clinical trials, which they do the same way they've always done them, that vaccine was already produced and ready to go and ready to ship. And that helped uh, uh, get that vaccine out quicker. It's not that any shortcuts were done. Uh, the safety is just as good as it has always been in our vaccine development. And people need to be aware of that. And uh, thank you again for having me on this panel today. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. So I have a question for Dr. Dobbs. You mentioned um, that we are now working on getting appointments and making sure that individuals know of availability. And just recently, Dr. Fauci has said that by April 2021, it will be open season for anybody. So as of right now, what are the eligibility criteria for individuals vaccination? Yeah, it, in Mississippi, the eligibility criteria are 65 or older, healthcare workers, include anybody who works in a healthcare setting, and if you have any significant medical issues if you're over 16. And it's just over 16 because the vaccine hasn't been studied in kids uh, much yet. Now, I do want for everyone to understand that the high-risk medical conditions are, is a very broad list. It includes anyone who's overweight with a BMI of 30 or more, smokers, if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you have autoimmune disorders, and there's some other things in that list that's, that's on our website. 1.4 million people in Mississippi currently qualify. So basically half of Mississippi qualifies. There's a, if, you know, if you're over 16 and you're not in absolute perfect health, there's a really good chance that you qualify. So look at the list, get an appointment. The flip side of that is, you know, we are getting around 45,000 doses a week of vaccine. And so it's going to take a while to chew away at, you know, 1.4 million people. So we have a very broad and inclusive criteria, but it makes sense because if we look at the people who are going to get really sick and the people who might die from COVID, that's who we're targeting. And um, we've already gotten most, you know, almost half the, four, the 75 and older and a good chunk of the 65 and older. We're super excited to have that protection out there. Take part in it. What, what about teachers? Teachers are teachers? coming up soon. You know, right. we're, wait, we're waiting to get our, our calling card yeah, here. Yeah, but I do want to remind you that right now, 40% of teachers qualify. But 40% mm -hmm. of teachers have not been vaccinated, right? So let's get our let's get our vulnerable teachers vaccinated ASAP while we're waiting to do it for everybody. Great. Excellent. So a question came. Tougaloo College has, and its students have participated in one of the largest cohort studies ever, the Jackson Heart Study. And so what can Tougaloo College do, along with other HBCUs, to position ourselves to be included in and support the large-scale study around COVID-19? Not just the vaccination, but additional studies, because many are ongoing right now. And this is for any panelist. Well, I'd like to say uh, they could volunteer uh, for, uh, for these vaccine trials. We, one of the things I was uh, gonna say to Dr. Fauci earlier, when you looked at the, uh, 
M M uh, M R A twelve seventy three trial or the Cove Cove trial, which was the coronavirus trial that was uh, sponsored by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease and Moderna, which is the most prevalent vaccine out there, you only saw uh, maybe about 10% uh, of those people were African-American. And I think the population is 13 to 14%. So if we could get uh, young people involved in these clinical trials and you know they, they, they pay them for doing this. So if they like me, when I was young, I, I needed a little, little uh, change, a little cash. So that, that's something I would encourage them to do. I, I think there are multiple studies uh, that the NIH has also. Uh, and uh, you as a professor uh, or associate professor, Dr. Walker, could probably lead those students with the Jackson Heart Study and Dr. Um, and, and some of the other uh, professors there could look at the studies that are out there and encourage those students. A lot of the students are studying, they're at home, but there's a lot of downtime that, that's there. And you know, I talked to you earlier about the uh, low amount of entrance um, into our medical schools for um, the underrepresented minorities. And one of the reasons is because our scores are low and I think we can do a better job in getting those scores up. Bottom line is they got to study and they got to know what to study and they got to know how to study. But uh, I'm glad that they have an interest in doing the research. I think that all they need to do is do some research to find some of the research and, and um, some of the trials are for minorities that's at the NIH and they can very well start uh, looking into that. But we, uh, you know, I'm always hammering and trying to bring other people into medicine because there's so few of us um, here, and we're trying to get the younger ones to get get on board and to try to be the best they can be uh, by doing that. But there are a bunch of studies out there. Thank you, Dr. Alexander Nickens, Dr. Dobbs. Are we allowed? to choose which vaccine that we actually want to take, either the Pfizer or the Moderna one? Um, you know, right now, the way it's operating um, and, the, and, the, and the real the equivalency of the two vaccines as far as side effects and efficacy, um, right now, you, you, don't, you don't really choose um, the location. And we can't actually assure that you're gonna have Pfizer or Moderna at any location at any given time right now. Although we've sort of settled into Moderna and Pfizer locations based on just logistics. I will say though, but as we move into future vaccines that maybe have some different performance, different performance characteristics, let's say the Johnson and Johnson, although we haven't seen the final data yet, it's going to be different. The good part is it, or the good parts are it's a single shot and it looks like it's extremely effective in preventing hospitalization and death, which is fantastic, but it's not going to be as good as Pfizer and Moderna in preventing any symptomatic illness. And since there is some difference, we want people to have choice. So I think once we get into different vaccines that have different performance characteristics, there will absolutely be choice. Dr. Dobbs, one question, if I may. I, these are questions that have come from my friends. And mm -hmm. one of them was uh, regarding the uh, monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, patients that, who's, uh, what patients would, would benefit from it and which patients are uh, the best patients to receive them, and how can they get them when they do have a positive uh, COVID test? Yeah, and, and, and that's a bit of a challenge um, because it's been going through all the hospitals and clinics, and so it's, it's, it's a network that's sort of outside of our control, although we're trying to work on that. So um, if you are at risk for bad outcomes of COVID and you're early and have recently been diagnosed, and you're, I think it's 12 and older, actually, I think it's a pretty broad age category, um, you're eligible, and we do think it, it has good benefits. Um, we have given out many thousands and thousands of doses here in the state of Mississippi, but they're all going through hospitals and clinics, and every hospital and clinic does it a little bit a different way. Um, I know UMC does it. Um, we're looking at expanding that to have a public sort of facing venue for outside referrals. Um, you know, St. Dominic's, other big hospitals in the area have been doing it. Um, so it is available in your location, what right right now is we ask you to talk to your primary care doc and see what you can do. 
but um, mostly it's going to be through big hospitals and they have different ways of doing it. So um, the right way to do it now is to talk to your doc and then see if they can refer you to one of the big medical centers. But we are looking at innovative ways to having a more fluid referral network. Um, it's, it's challenging because, you know, every hospital has their own way of doing things, but we're going to try to knit it together as best we can. Okay, thanks. I do want to say we have been giving it here at the university as well uh, in the emergency room. Um, but uh, <clears throat> if that person is a one time dose and if that person is eligible, they will get it uh, right there in the emergency room. If they're not requiring oxygen, um, then they get to get the medication, IV medication, and then they can go home. Some of our, we do have a clinic uh, on our ninth, seventh floor in, at the University of Mississippi um, where they can give it as well. Um, I've been getting these questions for about two weeks. So I stored them so that I could answer their, their questions. Let, let me um, make a quick comment, Myrna, if I may, about that. Crossgates Merritt Health is also administering those monoclonal antibodies and it's on Thursdays and that criteria is 65 or older. And you, as you know, it has to be given early. So right. they, they, they don't want it to be severe. So they want you not to be on oxygen or not to have increased oxygen, but they are giving it once a week on Thursdays. So Dr. Dobbs, how long does the vaccination provide immunity and what additional safety measures should we continue to follow through on even after being vaccinated? Yeah, so um, we don't know for sure because the vaccine hasn't been around all that long, obviously, um, based on some sort of indicator data. You know, we think a year or more is most likely for at least for this strain of virus. So that's, that's good. Um, so that's fantastic. Now, but after you get the vaccine, you still need to be careful. Um, in my office, we've all been vaccinated up here and we have to wear, we, we, we wear masks and we do Zoom and we stay away from each other uh, because it's not perfect. We don't know for certain that you can't be a silent carrier. Um, we think that that's probably less likely, but it's a plausible thing. CDC did come out with some new guidance. The one thing that is very different is that if you are fully immunized, and you're exposed to somebody, you don't have to go on quarantine for three months, kind of like if you've been a recent case. So there, the guidance is continually evolving as we learn more. Uh, but you know, essentially, let's keep on doing the same safety stuff and getting vaccinated. Um, you know, we're not really in a good spot. We're in a better spot, but just better doesn't mean it's good. Do we know whether any of the vaccinations help to reduce the virus's ability to mutate? Um, you know, as, as far as the, um, by diminishing spread, there will be a de facto diminishment in mutation, right? So that's one piece. Um, but the flip side of it is, is because the vaccine there, it, that is the, um, the pressure to drive mutation. So. Um, to, to get the maximum benefit and to close and to put the lid on this thing as quickly as possible. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you, everybody, please wear a mask in public. Don't have large social gatherings. If you do anything social, keep it extremely small and outdoors. If we don't, we're going to generate mutants and be chasing our tail forever. This is an opportunity right this minute to go ahead and get vaccinated and prevent transmission because we all want to get back to our normal productive lives. This question is for in any panelist. Do you know of any toxicological side effects of the vaccine? I know Dr. Alexander Nickens, your area is in cardiology. Dr. McNair, yours is in um, pulmonology. Do we know if it affects any of those organ systems. We know that the virus itself does, but do we have any data yet on the vaccine itself? You know, most adverse events, serious ones will happen within six weeks or so, and we haven't seen anything, right? So that's great. What we do see is we see a very small number of people who have anaphylaxis, very small. I mean, like, you know, ones of millions, right? So and it's people, and maybe polyethylene glycol, which is a constituent of the vaccines. It's a common medication additive. Um, but as far as like, you know, damage, we're talking about a very minute amount of stuff 
And it's a very simple vaccine. It's basically a little ball of fat with four lipids and you know one of those or one in a cholesterol molecule really, and then some mRNA on the inside. It's 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 really kind of naturally stuck. So our body um, should I mean it's it's really it's it's way less than a bag of Doritos of foreign material. So um, uh, I would concur. I have not uh, in the literature seen any increase in pulmonary or respiratory symptoms related to the vaccine itself. Yeah, nor have I. I, I think uh, Dr. Walker asked me about sudden death uh, with the vaccine. Uh, one of my uh, friends called me to say a patient got a vaccine and she died, um, but that person was already uh, in the hospital and was um, sick before that. So uh, I, I agree with you, Dr. Dobbs. A lot of them have been anaphylaxis, but to just look, I've looked for sudden death with the vaccine. I hadn't seen that. And um, we've all gotten the vaccine and hadn't had any uh, problems. Um, the problems lie of those patients that uh, actually get the disease. And I, I've, I see that all the time. I'm on, in the units uh, when people cannot survive because their oxygen levels are so low or they have some after afterwards. We just had a conference not, re, not too long ago that talked about the after effects of COVID and the fogginess that the patients may have after COVID. So, you know, the best thing to do is like you said, Dr. Dive, not get it. Prevention uh, is the best thing. And that's where my go red month is, okay? <laughs> I gotta put a plug in for that. Uh, most of these patients die, die, they have some kind of cardiovascular disease. And so I have, we have been um, pounding this in for people to be healthier for years. And now we see this is one of the reasons why we would like to have healthier people. Great point, Dr. Nickens. Just reminding us that it's not just about the vaccine, it's about overall health that we have to be conscious about. I can hardly believe we've already been together almost an hour now and our time is just about up. Um, do you have any lasting remarks, Dr. Dobbs, Dr. Alexander Nickens, Dr. Obi McNair? Um, get the vaccine when it's your turn, please. And let's stay safe. We're still in this, but we're making progress. Let's consolidate that progress and let's, let's get across the finish line. I, I wanted to say briefly, I have had several patients that have had the uh, COVID virus and now have natural antibodies. And I've been looking in the literature. I've not seen any proven cases of reinfection in people that were proven to have uh, shown at the time to have positive antibodies. So uh, I didn't know if uh, Dr. Dobbs, have you seen that, but uh, that herd immunity does. And I've seen people up to six to, to eight months after they've had it and they still had antibodies. So anyway, I was just curious if that, if that is true uh, or not. But uh, again, I would encourage everybody, everybody, everybody's eligible to take this vaccine. Amen. We just need another conference, okay? Uh, I know, I see that we have not even had a chance to get the questions from the floor. Um, and so maybe at some point we can do some town hall meetings. Uh, I, I'd be uh, happy to do those um, for any questions that, that um, may come up, not just about COVID, but just about having a healthier community. Uh, we just need to really, one thing I do want to say, a lot of patients, older and younger, have not even gone out of their homes because they are afraid that it's in the air. It is not in the air. It's on people. It comes from the respiratory system to the next respiratory system. And so I would urge them to get out and exercise and walk around their house if they can't, uh, you know, do it safely among other people. But uh, exercise, eating right, um, those are, and making sure you know your numbers. Um, got to put that plug in for us to be a healthy community. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much. And we thank 
all of you who have joined us today. We know this time went so fast. I'm sure Dr. Walters is going to take into consideration that suggestion of having a part two so that we can definitely hear your questions from the floor. But we are ecstatic that you joined us here at, again, the great Tougaloo College where history meets the future. Dr. Walters, any closing remarks? I just want to thank our esteemed panelists, Dr. Dobbs. Thank you for your partnership, Dr. Nickens and Dr. McNair. We, you know that you are absolutely on speed dial for us. And um, I thank you, Dr. Dobbs, for allowing us to contact Dr. Sutton in so many ways. And then thank you, Dr. Wendy White, for your connection and your leadership in pulling this all together. You were fabulous. We want to thank our IT partners, Illusion. Want to thank Dr. Linda Daniels for all the work she's done. And last but certainly not least, our moderator, Dr. Walker, you were fabulous as always, one of our rock stars here in our educate, in our one of our faculty. We're so proud of you and proud of everyone for your support and for your hard work in making sure our community uh, is knowledgeable and stays safe. And most definitely we will have a part two. So thank you guys. Please enjoy the rest of your day and be safe.